The Dead Pixel Society is returning to the annual D-Scoop Global Conference. We're once again hosting a Photo Imaging Connect mini conference track at D-Scoop Edge St. Louis World Expo May 7th through 10th, 2023 at the America Center, conveniently located in the heart of downtown St. Louis, Missouri. In addition to the excellent D-Scoop Education and Networking Program, there will be four 45-minute sessions, two on Monday, May 8th, and two on Tuesday, May 9th, specific for the photo imaging segment. Go to photoimagingconnect.com for more information and to get a special $50 discount on your registration fee. Hope to see you in St. Louis in May. Welcome to the Dead Pixel Society podcast, the photo imaging industry's leading news source. Here's your host, Gary Peugeot. The Dead Pixel Society podcast is brought to you by Media Clip, Advertech Printing, and IP Labs. Hello again and welcome to the Dead Pixel Society podcast. I'm your host, Gary Peugeot, and today we're joined by branding photographer Audrey Tappan, who comes to us today from the East Coast. Hi, Audrey. How are you today? I'm doing well, Gary. How are you? Good. Good. So first, before we get into your uh, expertise areas of branding and marketing, uh, let's hear the Audrey Tappan story of growing up in rural Florida. Sure. Yeah, I grew up on a tree nursery farm. So parents were kind of in the landscape world, Mm -hmm. grew up with animals and all that fun stuff. So taking photos of cows kind of just turned into taking photos of models. <laughs> and I am uh, in between there. I've lived in a couple different places, Georgia, Texas, mm-hmm. until I made my way to New York. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of the short version of it. So tell me about the business side of what your parents did, because that sounds to me like it would be almost a uh, boot camp for becoming an entrepreneur yourself is to watch what your parents did. Absolutely. I went to expos with my mom. So I was always the one running around giving out business cards to other exhibitors mm-hmm. at the event. I was her right hand woman and <laughs> really learned a lot from her and being on the farm as well. You had to work hard. It was the only way to live and get things done. Mm-hmm. It was just a great, mm-hmm. like you said, it's a great boot camp. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the things about entrepreneurship is, you know, people seem to think they they know what it is until they either try to start a business or work in a family owned business. Then they realize this is way harder than the, than Shark Tank makes it look on TV. Absolutely. And when things go wrong, you have to figure out how to get out of that rut. You know, housing crash came around in the early 2000s and they had to think about what they were going to do and change their business plan. Mm. And they, you know, chose having an organic blueberry farm. So finding a way to accept your failures and just keep on going was a really important lesson. Wow. That's quite the pivot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what was that? What was that like? I mean, I don't want to spend all the day talking about this, but I think it's kind of interesting because, you know, clearly they had expertise. They were interested in growing and growing, growing a business mm. that can use the pun. And then they realized something happened. So conditions in the market have changed. And how did they identify organic blueberries as the opportunity? I'm not sure how they came to the conclusion, but they were always in the plant business. And it was just kind of like, I love blueberries. And maybe there's not as much of a a market. There was a market, but there weren't other farmers growing blueberries in the area. And so Mm -hmm. she she found out the, uh, the sweet spot. Of what people wanted so so to speak the sweet spot of so to speak, yeah she found <laughs> in a land of tomatoes and oranges nice. she found the sweet spot yeah but you didn't choose to go into the family business which um and you just chose to get into the visual arts uh was that always something you were interested in and how did that lead you through your path or to your to the various places you went sure i grew up very creative and always thought I was going to do, or knew I was going to do something creative, but in high school decided that, you know, maybe I'll go into the Air Force. And I was in the JROTC program. And I remember I went to my superior, like the first sergeant in the program. And they said, hey, I need a recommendation letter. I want to go to Annapolis. 
and he kind of looked at me and he's like, are you sure that's kind of odd for you? And mm -hmm. I just kind of was like, that's interesting that he would put it that way. And mm -hmm. I would take a pause and went to a community college, realized I was good at taking photos. Mm -hmm. And then I transferred to SCAD in Savannah, Georgia, and just flourished. So yeah. it was, when I look back on my art, I realized I've always been an artist. Right. And for some reason, I tried to go a little left brain mm -hmm. and try and be like, oh, I'll go into the military. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad I didn't. Mm -hmm. So it's just kind of been a natural flow for me. I'll, it always mm -hmm. just worked out. I'm like, I want to do photography, mm -hmm. you know, kind of step after step, little goals, I mm -hmm. think. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting that you actually tried something different though, like JROTC, which I think is interesting. And it's it does show, I think, how important it is for people to try out different things, maybe outside their comfort zone that, you know, and if it doesn't work out, that's fine. Yeah. The program was a leadership program mm -hmm. as well. So okay. not only was I experimenting what, with what my interests might be, I was inadvertently becoming a better leader. And as a student, even though I knew it was a leadership program, wasn't thinking about that necessarily. I just knew I was having fun. I was doing the teams outside of the class. Right. And it it really instilled structure. Again, it's the hard work of being on a farm and then getting to high school, doing this pro program and learning organization and structure and how to lead other people. And even though I didn't go into the military, mm -hmm. I've been able to carry that over into my professional life and career because mm -hmm. I can help other people and lead them to be a better version of themselves mm -hmm. as an entrepreneur. So then you end up at SCAD, which for those who don't know, is the Savannah College of Art and Design. Why did you choose that? I mean, that is a very intense program. I thought I was going to apply to the Ringling College of Design in Sarasota, Florida, because it was local. And I thought, right, exactly. you know, that's easy enough, I guess. <laughs> and my mom had a friend whose son went there she said you know if he could do it over again he would want to go to SCAD I never even heard of it and I just thought well I mean Ringling sucks now apparently and <laughs> I should go to SCAD I applied and got in mm. and, like that was it you know mm. because I was transferring I think um the process was a little different for right. me but it was just someone you know vetting the college and me being like that looks like a great place to go it's yeah. only five away from home yeah it, 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 it is one of the uh best places in that region and i think on the east coast for that so so you went to school at scad and then you embarked on a photography career and you've and it looks like you've taken you know fashion and product photography and and those types of things was it what was that something that you were initially interested in or were you just something you just discovered you were good at i discovered i was good at it while i was at scad i was actually very and nervous to take pictures of people. Uh, well, yeah, because you took pictures of cows. Right. It was cows and trees <laughs> and, you know, the things that were around on the farm, like old tractors. And in my class, you know, in the fashion photography class, that was an assignment. You had to photograph models and then, and our, you know, more of a master photography class, you had to do products. And I was like, wow, this is really fun. I can you know, play around with colors a lot more. Mm -hmm. And again, it was just kind of a progression of my life and career that I didn't know mm -hmm. was going to happen. It wouldn't have happened if I hadn't gone to SCAD. I don't think I would be doing fashion photography today. Mm -hmm. So what, is, what do you have a, a, a type of fashion photography you like to do? Is it more the runway stuff or is it catalog or what is the type of photography that you feel is your hallmark? I do a lot of B2B photography, so commercial, business mm -hmm. to business. So I work with them to elevate their brand. And for me, that's my favorite part about it. It's not just that I'm doing photos. It's that I get to work with them on building a brand and a creative idea that they can level up their brand with. Mm -hmm. So you've had to kind of learn the branding side of it, I guess. Is that something that comes naturally to you or is this something that they taught in the business side of SCAD? I think it comes naturally to me as a creative thinker mm -hmm. 
being at SCAD, again, reinforced that structure and being able to move forward into different niches, then forcing me to photograph models and products. Mm -hmm. And I had to think of my own branding. So I think in the process of me learning who I was as a photographer, mm -hmm. I'm now able to translate that to other entrepreneurs and mm -hmm. help them with the process and give them those tips and tricks that I took years to learn. <laughs> so I kind of accelerate their process. So from your standpoint, as the child of entrepreneurs and now running your own business, what do you tell people a brand is? Because a lot of people have different definitions. What When you're talking to people and consulting with people, what do you tell them their brand is and how do you help them find their brand? Sure. A brand is something that is easily recognizable. You might have a product mm -hmm. and it is a brand, but if it's in the store, are people going to recognize it? Is it going to give them an emotional reaction? Mm -hmm. And when I see a photo of a favorite photographer or even just business person, graphic designer, mm -hmm. you know, an accountant, I can see their work on social media and instantly go, oh, that's, you know, that's Danielle Wallace. That's Lindsay Adler photography. So that's what a brand really is. Being right. able to tell people what you do, how you do it, mm -hmm. and what problems you're going to solve for them really quickly. So is it is it a distinct look or a feeling? I would say it's more of a feeling. Mm -hmm. Those go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. You need that unique look to evoke the feeling. Mm -hmm. But I think starting on the feeling side is the important part. When I work with a client, we create a creative deck for their project. Mm -hmm. And it's what colors are we going to use? What mm -hmm. emotion and style are you trying to get to? Who are you trying to sell to? Right. Know your target market is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. So your brand needs to have a look and a feel. Mm -hmm. To be cohesive. Because I think part of what happens in the photography world is there's a lot of photographers who just try to, they'll go to an, an exhibition or a conference or a show, and they'll try to copy like a lighting setup or something mm -hmm. like that without realizing they're not really putting themselves into it. They're just doing what another photographer is doing. Exactly. And going exactly with the look and the feel so for me as a photographer, I have a unique look. You learn by mm -hmm. copying other people and going, oh, that's set up, I can do that. Mm -hmm. But then it's now, how can I put my style and my feel into it? Right. And that goes for all of my clients because they're not photographers. Right. My clients sell products or do completely different professional services than I do. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've ever actually helped a photographer in their marketing <laughs> plan, if you will, mm -hmm. or knowledge of how to market themselves. It's mm -hmm. always been people in different professional fields. Do you find that photographers, when it comes when it come, when a branding discussion is taking place, let's say for example, you've got a client, and they're going to roll out a new uh colored ping pong balls for some reason. Do you feel that photographers are brought in at the end of the process, when they should be brought in at the beginning, that's where I think there's some disconnect there. Sure. I agree with you. As a photographer that gets to work with an agency that those brands come to, we work hand in hand. So the client will tell the agency, this is kind of what we're going for. And they bring me in and it's, all right, here's their creative deck or their brand guidelines and mm -hmm. let's kind of think about where that's going to go mm -hmm. and when working with clients outside of the agency i am coming in after the product has been made they have a bit more of an established brand mm -hmm. and they have those guidelines already that were made you know a year ago two years ago mm -hmm. so take that and then elevate it with the visuals so mm -hmm. we might not have the agency there to do a whole website revamp mm -hmm. so how can we elevate their branding without touching any of those other structures that have been built. Uh, so as a person who's hired to work with these with these folks, you obviously have to kind of do what they say, but I imagine there are times where it's like, you look at what's being handed to you, like you said, it's been worked on for two years, and it's like, oh my goodness, that is not effective. Correct. <laughs> Sometimes they give me the, the reins completely. I've had companies go, 
here are the guidelines in terms of, you know, our colors and maybe some past ads that they've run, mm -hmm. but they go, just give us whatever, whatever you feel, do it. And then there's clients that are a little bit more rigid. Mm -hmm. It's, it's just kind of about seeing what they need and no product has ever been the same. I imagine you want some sort of guidelines. I imagine it would be, it's almost counterproductive just to have someone say, well, here's the product, do whatever you want. That is true. A little bit of structure always helps. Uh, and if they don't give it to me, I kind of have to squeeze it out of them sometimes. Right. Uh, but in the end, it's always worked out. I think at the end of the day, they hire me because of that look and feel that they see in my portfolio. Mm -hmm. They might grab a photo of mine and say, hey, I loved this. Now do something like that with my product. Right. But it also be directed at you know their brand. But on the other hand, you probably also have people say, can you do it like that photographer? Mm -hmm. And that's yeah, got to be very, be very uh, not insulting, but uh, annoying, I guess, is, is a point. <laughs> sure. It can be, I don't know if disheartening is too heavy of a word, but it is, <laughs> it's like, oh, well, I mean, I want to do my work. But thankfully, because of my ability to elevate my branding or mm -hmm. niche down and focus on what I love to do. Mm -hmm. I'm now able to let those clients go or mm -hmm. say, Hey, I don't do that, mm -hmm. but I know someone who's amazing at doing photos like that. They right. love black and white. It, my portfolio is a kaleidoscope of a bunch of shit. So <laughs> <laughs> it is, um, it's nice to be able to let those clients move on right. to someone that better suit them. That must be a challenge, though, especially when you're earlier in a career, because obviously letting clients go is the antithesis of making money. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. when did you reach that point where you're more comfortable saying, I I don't need this gig so much that I don't am I'm going to not be able to do what I want to do? How long did it take you to do that? How many really bad gigs did you have to do before you're able to do that? Oh man, let's see. So I graduated in 2018, but I was, you know, a few years behind everyone else because I had a bit more of the community college aspect of it. So sure. I'm come out of it a few years late, mm -hmm. if you will. And I spent about three or four years mm -hmm. doing terrible weddings, real estate photography, mm -hmm. shots, family photography. It was terrible. Mm -hmm. And I finally was like, all right, I have the opportunity to make a move. And I did. So mm -hmm. I came over to the East Coast and I've been here almost two years. Mm -hmm. And I would say maybe a year, year and a half in is when I finally mm -hmm. was able to let those clients go. Mm -hmm. But it was a year, year and a half of boots on the ground, networking events, cold pitching brands, mm -hmm. building email lists. Uh, so it wasn't easy, but... Right. It was, you know, all in all, I could have, I probably spent six years from the time I picked up a camera and got my first page. And then you throw COVID in there, right? So, oh, the, so absolutely. <laughs> right. You know, that yeah. was right. You know, you're getting out, you're trying to develop your brand, you're building your business, and then mm -hmm. worldwide pandemic comes into play. Now, fortunately, yeah. I guess in some ways, people weren't shooting so many weddings and things, so you could find products to to, to photograph. Yeah, and at the time, I was doing products, but also the real estate photography. So I worked through the pandemic a lot because they were empty homes yeah. and we were able to do that. So I did have a bit of a buffer in terms of getting that income I needed, mm -hmm. but still the products I was working with were not the ideal brand. Yeah. Not exactly, you know, clothing, yeah. beauty products yeah. or et cetera. I mean, that's right. Yeah. But the East Coast is is where it's at. If you are someone that wants to do products and work with brands, mm -hmm. you know, East Coast, West Coast, that's where you want to be if you want to be in the marketing world. When you talk about putting your boots on the ground and networking, uh, what are some tips you suggest for someone who is wants to you know use in-person networking and things like that to grow their business? I find a lot of uh, creative folks, that's something they struggle with. Mm -hmm. And the fact, you know, working a room, not just being social and hitting up the bar and the hors d'oeuvre table, but actually making it effective. What what suggestions do you have for someone who, you know, needs to build their business through networking, which I trust you have to do on the East Coast. It's all a business referral 
type business, right? Absolutely. I think something I learned from going to events is showing up with a goal. Mm -hmm. Now I have a goal of getting at least two new contacts. And when you start doing that, it becomes so much more natural that, you know, you could come out of an event with four or five contacts and the more you get, the better your ratio. Cause you have to get 20 no's to get one. Yes. Mm -hmm. So showing up with a goal and just talking I know it's hard as someone like myself who finds it hard to walk up to a person and say, Hey, I'm Audrey. What do you do? Mm -hmm. You know, after the first time it gets a lot easier. Mm -hmm. So having a goal and an ideal client for me, it's people that are in marketing and mm -hmm. represent brands. So I find the person in the room that does that. Mm -hmm. Maybe you have to talk to three people mm -hmm. to find out who that person is, but mm -hmm. it's just practice. Mm -hmm. And the worst thing that could happen is someone says no. And right. if that's the worst thing that could happen, right. You know, then you're still in the same place. You haven't lost anything. Right, right, right. Yeah. Because, because I find that in this day and age, when you talk to people about marketing and things like that, they always talk about things like email and, and uh, newsletters and social media. And I've got an Insta page and all that, but they, but they kind of don't, push the in-person networking piece, mm -hmm. which I think is overlooked in this post-COVID world almost to an extent, because that used to be how you got business back in the day was you met people or in the, and they met mm -hmm. people and they told you about other people. And then COVID kind of put a big pause on that. And I think it's it's coming back, but it's coming back more slowly. Is that what you're seeing? Where I'm at, it has been much better recently. Mm -hmm. I would say, you know, eight months ago, it was still hard to find in-person events. And a lot of them were virtual. They'd be a Zoom call. And that's great. But it's still not the same as standing in front of someone and saying, this is who I am in 3D. Mm -hmm. right. And you will probably remember me much more than being one of 20 people on the screen. Right. And there's nothing better, really, because they're going to remember you and show up dress to represent your brand, mm -hmm. try to stand out a little bit, even if you're a lawyer and suits are what you all wear, something that will make you different. You mm -hmm. have to be memorable. Mm -hmm. And you know, the first five seconds that you meet someone, right? So social media is great. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you as someone in the B2B world, I have never gotten a client off of social media, right? I use it as a portfolio. But those in-person networking events are where I gain actual clients. Coming into the photography business, have you branched out into video or anything else? Or is that something you've really not wanted to touch? Because video seems to be hot right now, especially mm -hmm. in you know short explainer videos for products and things like that. Have you had to branch out into that at all? I have. And even when I was in college years ago, I guess almost five years ago, my professor told me, you all need to be knowledgeable in video because not only do they make a lot more money than you will, <laughs> but people always need video. When you say look and feel, video mm -hmm. really makes you feel. Right. And with my clients, I've only had to do one or two kind of full scale video shoots. Mm -hmm. But at the moment, I'm focusing more on the kind of reels and GIFs. I do a lot of animation. Yeah. So it's more of taking their product and animating it and making it exciting to mm -hmm. see on social media versus the actual video of the product or someone using it. Right. And mm -hmm. that's a whole different level of visual literacy, right? Yeah, definitely. Because it's one thing to show the product in use, but saying, how can I take this still image and making make it just as exciting and evoke emotion that makes someone want to buy it mm -hmm. and that's where I think I have a lot of fun because I can be creative and I can make things that aren't real on my computer mm -hmm. versus you know I only have this model and this product to work with mm -hmm. and we don't have money to source a studio for this to be mm -hmm. so really great mm -hmm. and I can do that right here on my computer so have you had to do any animations for organic blueberries is that something that's come up <laughs> 
<laughs> no, I haven't, but I was in the logo of my family's business. So no video, but I was the face of the, the business for a little while. But now my mom and sister actually do dehydrated kale chips, which are amazing. Slow Foods Kitchen. Nice. But I'm their photos and video. And though I don't get paid as much for those gigs. <laughs> You get all the you get all the kale you can manage, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I've I've done some fun stuff with kale, but <laughs> at the moment, that is all. <laughs> well, Audrey, if people want to reach out and learn more about you and your work, where can they go? They can see my portfolio at AudreyTappen.com, and you'll find all of my links and email on there. So check that out. And just, you know, let me know if you love it. And you especially want to hear from up and coming entrepreneurs in the visual arts. True? Absolutely. I love building a network. Networking is king. <laughs> and I love hearing other people's stories, supporting them. It's all about supporting each other because we can't grow if no one knows who we are. Well, thank you, Audrey, for your uh, expertise and your story today. And uh, best wishes on future success. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Gary. Thank you for listening to the Dead Pixel Society podcast. Read more great stories and sign up for the newsletter at www.thedeadpixelssociety.com.